All right, let's get started. Um, hello and welcome to Neighborhood Unitarian Universalist Church of Pasadena. Welcome to all friends, members, and guests. My name is Benjamin Hosking, and I am a member of your Board of Trustees. This is also my first welcome word, so woohoo. Um, Neighborhood Church creates and grows an inclusive community of faith connected by love, spirit, and service. We acknowledge our presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples, the traditional caretakers of the lands and waters of this campus. With respect for the rights and wisdoms of indigenous people, we acknowledge our harmful colonial histories and commit to decolonizing our own practices, to learning new ways of being in community, in good relationship with the indigenous peoples of this land and with the land itself. Today's service will be a little different than usual. For example, I am not Reverend Teresa. Um, since Reverend Teresa and some of our staff are in Pittsburgh for this year's UUA General Assembly, we thought we would, we, uh, we thought we would kind of join them uh, and watch a recording of the General Assembly Sunday worship service from last year. And since that service was more than two hours long, we have pared it down and will be showing just one hour of it. It will start with the chalice lighting and end with the sermon. Please take a moment to silence your devices as we begin our service. While Frank lights the chalice, we hope you will sit back and picture yourself surrounded by a couple thousand other UUs all in worship together and let yourself be taken up by this timely, moving, and deeply meaningful worship service. Feel free to sing along if you like. Families with young children are welcome in the sanctuary or in the narthex. The family service is on hiatus for the summer and will return in the fall. There is a special announcement today. You are invited to join us after the service on Sunday, July 2nd for a celebration brunch for our interim minister, Reverend Teresa. This will be her last day with us in honor of Reverend Teresa's passion for baking scrumptious sweets. It seems fitting to have this as a theme. This is your chance to share your baking skills by bringing a breakfast pastry or other sweet treat to share. If sweets are not your specialty, please bring a brunch dish to share. In Reverend Teresa's three-year interim ministry with us, she has led us through the necessary work of healing, helping us look to the future, prepare for a surge, and call our newly settled minister, Reverend Omega. We wanna thank Reverend Teresa for all she has done for us. If you would like to contribute towards a small gift or volunteer for setup and cleanup, please contact Farrell Menon at menon at usc.edu. That's M-E-N-N-E-N at usc.edu. Please be in touch by Wednesday, June 28th so we can get everything wrapped up. We look forward to seeing you there as we send Reverend Teresa off to her next chapter with much gratitude. Okay, big one. What about solar power at Neighborhood Church? Following today's service, come to the living room of Neighborhood House to learn more about options for solar power on the church campus and discuss what the next steps might be. Our order of service and many other announcements are available as a link in the Sunday email posted in the narthex or through the QR code on the back of your hymnal. You can always get more information on these and many other activities at the welcome table. Again, welcome to Neighborhood Church, whoever you are and wherever you are on your spiritual journey. Welcome to this inclusive faith community connected by love, spirit, and service. And today's for the give the plate, share the plate. Um, giving is a spiritual practice through which we put our values into action. Each Sunday, our congregation dedicates 100% of its contributions to a social justice organization or activity. In addition to the plate, online giving is available using the QR code on the donations box just outside the sanctuary or using the text instructions shown on the screen. If you wish to make a payment toward your pledge or contribute to church operations, Make a note in the subject line or use an envelope available in the at the donation box. In light of the over 500 anti-trans bills that have been proposed across the country in 2023 alone, our Share the Plate program will be supporting organizations that work with trans and gender diverse youth for the month of June. In the spirit of supporting the work that fellow Unitarian Universalists are doing to combat anti-LGBTQ plus hate across the country, the Share the Plate Committee reached out to the Reverend Sarah Lawal, neighborhood's former director of religious education, who is now the minister at Boise Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, to tell us about this week's organization, 
add the words Idaho. Here is Reverend, a video from Reverend Sarah. Hello, beautiful people of Neighborhood Church. What an honor to share in this moment of generosity and justice together. As many of you know, I am the Reverend Sarah Laval. I used to serve as your Director of Religious Education, and I now serve as the Minister of the Boise UU Fellowship here in Idaho. I cannot express the depth of my gratitude for your desire to support the trans community impacted by the horrible anti-trans laws passed in our state legislature, laws that are sadly sweeping the country. Idaho is one of a few states whose state constitution still does not include protection for the LGBT community in our Human Rights Act. 14 years ago, Add the Words Idaho formed to advocate for those equal protections in our constitution. Since then, they've expanded their organizing efforts to include education, advocacy, and community support, and direct aid to our gay and trans community members most impacted by Idaho's restrictive and invasive laws and continued inequality. For years, our legislature has introduced and passed laws targeting our LGBTQ community and specifically our trans youth, banning and criminalizing everything from bathrooms to participation in sports. And perhaps the worst law thus far was the one our governor signed in April banning gender-affirming care for youth with criminal penalties for both doctors and parents who seek this care. Care which we know follows national evidence-based standards of care for gender dysphoria. This year has felt devastating, overwhelming, and we are outraged. As Unitarian Universalists, we have always been and will continue to be on the front lines fighting for the rights and dignity of our trans beloveds, youth and adults. But after my eldest child came out as trans a couple of years ago, this fight has become very personal. And Add the Words has been there every step of the way. They have been leaders in this fight. They have held legislative advocacy trainings, preparing folks to testify for committee hearings. They helped us parents and doctors secure meetings with countless legislators and the governor's office. They held rally after rally to bring love and care and support to our trans youth and families. And not only that, during peak times of our legislative advocacy, they hosted a community space for folks to rest, process, get something to eat and hydrate and connect with each other. It was so appreciated and so incredibly healing. Add the words also stewards a robust mutual aid fund to give financial support to our LGBTQ plus community members who find themselves in need and struggling and are now working to expand that aid to youth and families who will need to access care or relocate out of state. In fact, just this week, I was connected with an Idaho youth who has moved to Portland and needs support and assistance, and I was able to connect her with Add the Words and with our Portland UUs. It's incredible to know that our UU churches are reaching out, forming networks, and will always be there when help is needed. Perhaps the most incredible thing about Add the Words is that they are an entirely volunteer-led organization. Community organizers and volunteers donate their time and talent hours and hours to keep it running and keep the community connected and supported. To know that you are directing your support and sharing your generosity with a conservative state like ours means so much to us. You are reaching beyond your walls, across state lines to say, we see you. We've got your back. We're here to fight with you. Well, we feel it. Add the words feels it. Your gifts will have a direct impact. This 
is what living out our Unitarian Universalist faith looks like. Bless you and bless this work. Uh, will today's volunteers please bring the plates forward? Thank you for giving generously. And we're also gonna start our, um, the recording of the GA, so thank you. If you can sing, I invite you to sing with us. If you can't sing, I invite you to sing with us. <laughs> Either way, I invite you to move your body, to sway, to rock with the music. with me. flying through space at a thousand miles an hour and still the earth holds us steady. I am told that when you have been carrying a baby outside of your body, holding a beloved and rocking them, you sometimes find yourself rocking all on your own, being rocked, caring for creation. I know a preacher who sways back and forth on the street corner or in the pulpit, rocking, being rocked, loving into being our co-creation. Spirit of life, divine mother of many names and one abundant love. We come to this moment from many places, thousands of stories, thousands of storms, flying 1,000 miles an hour on this one rock. We come full of ideas and excitement, new connections. We come with rage, fear, loneliness. We come with something to give. We come needing something, but not even sure of what that is. And even if we're overwhelmed by all of this, we're so grateful to be here. So grateful to be alive, grateful for the people who surround us. We give thanks for this moment. Let us rest here in your embrace. Rock me in the arms of my divine mother, divine mother. Rock me now, rock me ancestors hold us here in this sacred gathering your presence felt or longed for now and always you remind us that while our bodies sway we are connected in so many ways ancestors there are so many more of you than when we last gathered in body together ancestors hold us 
let us hold you, let us call you by name. I invite you to share aloud. Let us speak out loud in the chat those who have passed and who are still with us. Kim Hampton, Jean Pupke, John Newhall, Matthew Taylor, Kelly McConnell, Alandria Williams, Hope Johnson. Ancestors hold us, strengthen us. We grieve, we remember, and we give thanks for all who have come before. Rock me in the arms of my divine mother, divine mother. Rock me now, rock me in the arms of my divine mother, divine mother. Rock me now. Like those who have come before, like the person I was last year, like the you of one hour from now, and the community that we used to be. We are all always changing. The ancestors called into this place, they were far from perfect. And even with the head start on their mistakes, we have not learned all the lessons. As people and communities, our courage flickers and falters. Here in the witness of community, we open to the truth that we do not always get it right. We call to mind the moments when we have failed to live out of our deepest values. When we've been mean-spirited or selfish, when we've been complicit, sometimes for survival, with white supremacy and systems of oppression. When we have done harm, even unknowingly, to our beloveds. Here in the witness of community, we know and name that there are those among us who have been hurt. We have not and are not always treated right. Many of us carry invisible wounds from our communities, our ancestors, our churches, our beloveds, and our faith. May the terms of forgiveness be ours. May our shared experience be a blessing. May we find new pathways to healing. For we contain multitudes. Growth is a messy affair, imperfect and unceasing. May rest offer the chance to form new connections. Our brains and our relationships and our stories nurtured in darkness. We open to this day. There was a time not long ago I thought all I what to do and what to say how to act to get my way now there's nothing more I need than to feel her close to me nothing more I'll ever need than to feel her comfort me loving embrace. May we find an ease that tempts us not into shutting out the world, not denying it, not fixing it all by ourselves. Lead us to rest, to be held, to hold, 
to not know, to try anyway, to love, to take delight, to rise again and again, to co-create the world. May we find this place and this people of welcome and belonging. May we be that place and those people. Rock me in the arms of my divine mother, divine mother. Rock me now. Rock me in the arms of my divine mother, divine mother. Rock me now. Rock me now. One more time. Rock me. My friends used to ask me, why do you go to church? After I became a minister, they stopped asking. <laughs> but the thing is, I never did. Why do I go to church? Church is the place that has broken my heart more times than any other. The beauty of its potential obscured by the labor of reality that churches are human, not utopian endeavors. Every church, every church I have ever been a part of has never been exactly who they proclaim to be. Never been exactly who I wanted them to be. Never been exactly who I needed them to be. Why do I go to church? I have witnessed professionals violating the trust granted to them, cloaking their deceit in the garb of spiritual language, congregational bullies allowed to rampage in the name of nice or freedom of belief, causing beloved people to step away, the pain too great to continue. I have witnessed trauma like a puppeteer pulling the strings, compelling us to play out old stories again and again and again and again. Why do I go to church? Why do we keep going? The longer you stay in, the more grief you accumulate. The grief of the people who left left the faith, left your church to attend another or not, or simply left life. And even as the joy of new people arriving rises, you look around sometimes and realize that you don't recognize anyone anymore, and you wonder if that must mean it's time for you to, to leave. Why, church? For it will be true that the church you join will not be the same church you leave, changed by your presence, changed by the presence of every other. That's the beauty, that's the magic, but it's also the heartbreak. There is so much that changes in the life of a church. The musical stylings of generations come and go. The language and words of reverence shift. We decenter what was once assumed to be our essence to reveal the liberatory power within. We constantly evolve and revolve around our core, that determination of love to break forth. That question, why? church does not have one answer, not one that can endure a lifetime, not one answer the same for each of us, or answers like stars forming new constellations guiding us in every season of life, pointing us towards a simple impulse. Why church? Well, simply because church. I call it the casserole reflex. 
that when the church hears the news of the diagnosis or the accident or looming crisis of death, divorce, or disaster, somehow, even before they realize it, the casserole dish is in the oven and instinct to care just baked in. The same reflex taught me that when certain events happen, you don't call, you don't text, you go. Awkwardly, sure. Uncomfortably, of course, but you show up. Why? Because church. It's, amen. It's the feeling we get gathered for imperfect worship. A collection of friends, strangers, united by an almost indescribable promise that answers a question coded deep within us, the need to belong, to be reminded of that belongingness, the full embrace that conveys the truth that all the parts of you, the questioning parts, the doubting parts, the cynical parts, the hurt parts, are not only welcome, but they are necessary here. That if universal salvation is true for all of us, it must be true for all parts of us too. Amen? Amen. Why? Because church. It's a temporal embrace. An embrace with one arm ancestral and the other futuristic, converging together, a complex embrace, holding as much pain as potential, a belonging that grounds us and orients us into time itself, a belonging that says that you, yes, you, are part of an unfolding story, the end of which has not been written, and here... We will face it not alone or unequipped, unprepared or unprotected. For we have stories and practices, rituals and music and ancestors and baggage. And you don't need to strike out on your own. You don't need to make it up all by yourself and look around. You don't have to do it alone either. For you have a people. Why? Because church. For a society that tells me that I need to be self-made, I need church that tells me I exist because we are. For if the choice were independence or interdependence, there is no question that I would choose that gnarlier path. We can go together. And it is church more often than any other place that never lets me forget it. Why? Because church. It's the beauty, you know it, of a child dedicated in the arms of its family. It's the 85-year-olds who, when the pandemic hit, became Zoom experts overnight and then taught others. (laughs) Casting off the confines of a physical sanctuary for a digital cathedral, knowing the church was never a place but a people. Why? Because church. And when my heartbreak becomes too much, caught in that cavernous gap between promise and reality, I testify that every time I muster the courage to keep showing up, I surprise myself that I can find love in broken people and hopeless places. And I find that even my own brokenness doesn't disqualify me when I'm willing to put in the work. And even as certain people grate on me like sandpaper, (laughs) I feel them wearing down my rough places granting me much-needed lessons in patience and compassion, forgiveness and humanity, giving me the chance to practice being human. Why? Because church. For our churches are like base camps, teams fanning out, forming rapid response networks of prayer and safe passage for all who seek safety, for all who seek self-determination and shelter. We feed each other and are fed. We dismantle the prisons of supremacy living within and around us, all the while growing us awkwardly and lovingly as we navigate the challenges of a mission that calls us to the brink of all that we love and know and invites new commands us to step out in faith, to commit to be changed, to covenant, to promise to a journey without knowing 
what intimacy, what vulnerability will be asked of us as we embark. For if we knew friends, we wouldn't say yes. But when we look back, we can't help but thank God we did. Why? Because church. I have witnessed friendships formed in social halls, sparked in classes that have saved lives. Zoom chats brimming with prayer, heartfelt messages launched not into a void, but as offerings into the heart center of a community that breathes, that conspires both IRL and within and beyond those ones and zeros that constitute our now other gathering place. All of it revealing shards of holiness, reflecting belovedness imperfectly, but truly whispering, you are not alone. You belong beyond your choosing. The story is not over and we each have a part to play. And though you may not believe it or feel it moving within you or trust it enough to let your guard down, what church can do is make love tangible, not simply theoretical, joined together in one body in church. Amen. witness is with us in liminal spaces feeling so breathless death is an exhale inhale with us new life cuts through strife like a knife and somehow we take it in moving for the win shaping change and endings begin you are a holy friend
Before there was anything, there was God, a few angels, and a huge swirling glob of rocks and water with no place to go. The angels asked God, why don't you clean up this mess? So, God collected rocks from the huge swirling glob and put them together in clumps and said, some of these clumps of rocks will be planets, and some will be stars, and some of these rocks will be just rocks. Then God collected water from the huge swirling glob and put it together in pools of water and said, some of these pools of water will be oceans, and some will be clouds, and some of this water will be just water. Then the angel said, well, God, it's neater now, but is it finished? And God answered, nope. So on some of the rocks, God placed growing things and creeping things and things that only God knows what they are. And when God had done all this, the angels asked God, is the world finished now? And God answered, nope. God made two humans from some of the water and stardust and said to them, I'm tired now, please finish up the world for me. Really, it's almost done. But the humans said, we can't finish the world alone. You have the plans and we are too little. You are big enough, God answered them. But I agree to this. If you keep trying to finish the world, I will be your partner. The humans asked, what is a partner? And God answered, a partner is someone you work with on a big thing that neither of you can do alone. If you have a partner, it means that you can never give up because your partner is depending on you. On the days you think I am not doing enough, and on the days I think you are not doing enough, even on those days, we are still partners and we must not stop trying to finish the world. That's the deal. And they all agreed to that deal. Then the angels asked God, is the world finished yet? And God answered, I don't know. Go ask my partners. It was March 2020. You know the week. I'm sitting in my home office, and just a few feet away from me, my two teenagers are in the living room homeschooling. And a few feet away from them, my partner's at the kitchen table. It is her turn to supervise. Every dividing line that I have carefully practiced in my ministry up until this moment, boundaries that keep my family in one world and my church and work in another, have come undone. Just like everything else I've come to know about what it means to be a minister and do church. All in a matter of days. A pit starts forming in my stomach, and the tears in my eyes feel just a breath away as my body readies itself for grief. I listen to and read every news story I can find as if tea leaves for the future that we will all soon face. With every headline, my stomach grows tighter, and I write letters, and then I make videos to the people in my church and in my family who, especially those people who in this new world are required to acquiesce 
whether they believe it or not, they are technically over 65 and at risk. For no practical reason at all, I decide I should call Lynn. In the congregation that Sean and I serve, that is the Foothills Unitarian Church in Fort Collins, Colorado, Lynn is one of our elders. Literally, in this case, she's 88. There she is, she's on the left. She's next to two other beloved elders, Bob and Bev. Lynn has been in our congregation for over 50 years. I don't know exactly why I decide to call Lynn, but I just, I just know I need to hear her voice. Lynn is one of many partners I end up calling in those days. I mean, I obviously also call Sean a lot. And then I call Sue and Sarah and Scott and Nancy and Arpy and Johanna and Glenn and Mary and Terry. I could keep going and going and going with my list of names. Who's on your list? Those people you called on in those days and who call on you. I invite you to just share a few names right now into the space or into the chat. Those partners who you count on. In those days, there was this whole web of checking in just called into being. And in every hello, the tender awareness of feeling way too little. Like our story. And in every, how are you? The humble surrender of not having any freaking idea about any plans. Except also there was this trust, this automatic response into a steady practice of turning to each other, our partners, who were at least company in the chaos, even though none of us knew when or if the storm would pass. It is, after all, the call that saves us and the checking in on each other that connects us with something greater, that love that abides. The voice on the other end that says simply yet powerfully, we are still here. We survived. In those days when we had no idea what it would mean for us to do church, at least not as we had known it for decades or even centuries. In those days, we know, knew most clearly how to be the church. We knew to make the calls, we knew to give the money, and we knew to show up in ways that were for more than just ourselves. We also knew we'd need to learn things we'd never known and really never wanted to know. We also knew that we'd have to be okay with being uncomfortable, maybe for a long time. The only good news was that at least it would be over by the following May. <laughs> when the UUA promised that we could get back to normal. <laughs> Just kidding, Susan. <laughs> Mostly. said May. <laughs> Most of all, in that total disorientation, we knew we needed help, not just from within, but also beyond our congregations. The covenant among our churches was never more alive than in those days. As lay folks and professionals and UUA staff and community ministers and partners in our community, especially the disabled community who had so much to teach us in this time, all of us, 
All of us were in on an ongoing conversation where no one had all the plans, everyone felt too little, and yet we knew we had a big thing worth doing and our partners are counting on us and so we could not give up. In those days, we knew instinctively how to be the church. And even more, we knew most clearly why it matters that we are the church. Not perfectly, of course. I had an idea actually for a GA workshop where we all could just share our most embarrassing tech messes. That'd be fun, right? For us, I'm pretty sure we'd have to tell about our, this last Christmas Eve when literally the feed, it just, just for some reason that night, it decided it would not load. And then it loaded and then there was no sound. And then, oh right, I actually can't even tell you about it because I wasn't there because my family had a COVID exposure two days before. Yeah, it was horrible. <laughs> but in sharing our stories, we would, and we all have our stories, right? But in sharing our stories, we'd remember that neither tech nor perfection are the point. The people are the point. And the partnership with each other and with God, that's something greater. That's, and the deal we make to keep trying, that's the point. And we did it. We are here. We are here. And we survived. Since I started seminary in 2007, article after article and lecture after lecture has described the institutional and the local church in every way opposite of how I have just described it. I have heard constantly of the church's imminent demise the death of Sunday school and or our inevitable implosion and or slow drift into oblivion. In seminary, we learned that millennials thought we were irrelevant. Boomers would soon be focusing on their retirement vacations. And the silent generation were aging out, over the, uh, out of the heaviest volunteer lifting that we'd relied on them for for so long. Now you may have noticed that in addition to Gen Zers who weren't yet constituted, they left out one generation in this analysis, which in my opinion was a miscalculation, <laughs> given how many of us Gen Xers are now holding lay and professional leadership in our congregations. <laughs> to quote Nirvana, oh well, whatever, Never mind. <laughs> My point is, long before the pandemic came along, our beloved local congregations, this institution to which many of us have dedicated countless hours, if not our whole lives, have needed what Diana Butler Bass has described as a major reorientation if, quote, we are going to remain relevant in this new world. Long before the pandemic, our families and children weren't already were not showing up consistently or at all, and yet needed ministry more than ever. Already before the pandemic, giving was changing as younger generations have fewer resources and really didn't get this whole idea of pledging anyway. Already we needed to be fully and fluidly pres present both online and in person, even though we really had no idea what this even meant. And already our churches were some of the least progressive, most monocultural, white, hetero spaces that many young people will encounter in their whole lives, despite the story many of us tell ourselves or the call that most of us know our faith makes. Long before the pandemic came, our congregations already needed to change, and they were already at risk. I don't mean, though, at risk of closing, especially those of you in our smaller congregations. You, you're kind of like that tiny mint plant that I planted in my backyard, 
just survives even the heaviest snows. But more, I mean that we were already at risk of forgetting. Forgetting that why that was so clear to us in those early days of the pandemic. And that were also so clear to us in the early days after Trump's election, or in the early days after 9-11, or after George Floyd was murdered, or after the floods took everything, or on any of those days when the bottom drops out from the middle of our lives and we know we cannot do it alone. In those days, the why of church surrounds us and scares us and soothes us all at once as we feel seen and found and held and charged as if for the very first time. This feeling, this, this ministry is the promise of the local Unitarian Universalist Church with the not radical, still radical idea that we are all in this life together at its center. And when the crisis comes, we know this promise so well. We feel its urgency and its call, and we instinctively say yes. It's just on the other days. When the crisis fades and we are back in ordinary times, we all too often forget. Or what's more true, is that we have our hearts broken enough times that we choose to forget. As Sean said, churches are human enterprises. And to give yourself to a Unitarian Universalist congregation is to say yes to disappointment or worse. And so we lose faith, we get tired, we stop going or we keep going resentfully. We shrink our dreams or grow bitter or numb or all of the above, especially in these days. Just a couple of months ago, some of our dearest congregants came to me to say they were, they were feeling disconnected from the church. It wasn't, it wasn't a complaint. It was, it was more like a confession. These are our past board members, our most generous donors. Just a few years ago, they, they could not have imagined their lives without our congregation. And yet here they were feeling like they just weren't sure about any of it anymore. And they aren't alone. In the intervening days and weeks and what felt like decades between early 2020 and mid-2022, a lot of us have become familiar with this sense of disconnection. Not just because of the pandemic, with its polarization and politicization and that pit in our stomach that we never had time to tend to, but also because of the rise of white supremacy and fascism as it replied to what many of us believed was progress in creating a truly multicultural, multiracial democracy. And then alongside that, the climate crisis has come in close, which in my area now means we have wildfires in December. And in yours, might mean still trying to recover from the last storm when the next one comes. The combination of all of these collective forces constitute for us a moral injury, a trauma. And yet we are pushed to keep going we push ourselves to keep going, get back to work, even while death and extinction surround us and threaten us daily. We are encouraged to return to normal as if the last two and a half years were like a blip in a Marvel movie. We have survived. And also we are not the same. Whatever notions we had of the world being finished, or at least on its way, 
have come undone. Whatever notions we had of we being the ones to finish it have come undone. In so many ways, our churches, our association, the institutions around us have come undone. There is so much work to do, so much ministry needed, and we are so small, so tired, and so in need of ministry ourselves. Is it, is it finished yet? Can I tell you something? When our president invited me to preach this service, just like Pastor Jacqueline Duhart told us was her first reaction, my first reaction was also no way. Obviously, I did get to the second reaction, which was, oh God, I'm doing this. But that first reaction was real, and it was rooted both in my terror and equally my confusion about what it means to be here with all of you at General Assembly. Now, to be clear, over the years I've loved much at GA, I have cried and laughed and sung with joy in the rare and powerful experience of being with thousands of other UUs while we are reminded both of who we are and who we are yet called to be. And still, I have also always felt confused about what it means to do Unitarian Universalism in general. Because where Unitarian Universalism has meaning for me is in the particular, in the people and the partners and the stories, even the particular annoyances and frustrations and heartbreak, most of all in the particular repair and the change. Unitarian Universalism comes alive by way of a localized, particular covenant grounded in place where hearts can be opened and mindsets can shift over years of often hard and even painful ministry to and with the imperfect people who keep showing up. It is like this little button that one of our congregants gave me a few years ago. It said uh, in big letters, I love people. And then in little letters underneath that it said, in theory. <laughs> the grand ideals of Unitarian Universalism that inspire so many of us to travel across the country or to log on in the middle of our busy lives, this is us loving people in theory. Here we can connect with the good news of our faith that brought so many of us to our churches in the first place, and yet keep the promise at arm's length, set in bold generalities and sweeping statements of conscience that may or may not have real meaning back in our hometowns and home churches. Which again, this is not unimportant, and after all we have been through, keeping our faith at arm's length is understandable. It's just this all of this is not the deal we make as Unitarian Universalists. Our deal is not to love people in theory. Our deal is to love them in real life. Our deal is to keep calling that web of check-ins into being, not just when we're feeling the gift of being in this life together, but in the gut punch in the times when we most feel like everyone around us isn't doing enough or doing it wrong, when it feels like the only best option is to forget right then, by which I mean, of course, right now, our faith invites us to remember how urgently it matters that we show up and be the church, not just for the rest of the world, but for ourselves. Not just for ourselves, but for that something greater. Because without the people being the church, there is no church. And without the local church, there is no Unitarian Universalism. Which means the most important part of our, this, our general assembly, 
is the way it inspires us to return to our very specific assemblies, our congregations, virtual and IRL, how we will take the inspiration and energy of our theoretical and theological commitments and connect them with the very real life why that we know so well when the crisis hits and how we stitch all of this onto our hearts so that it pulses with urgency even on the ordinary days or in the days when bitterness is everywhere. In these days, we are called not just to go back to church, but to be the church and to invite our friends and neighbors to join us as partners because so much has been lost and so much has come undone, which also means that it must be time to build. It must be time to take all the lessons of who we knew to be in early 2020 and let them inform and drive a new vision where we can meet the no less urgent needs of June 2022 and beyond. I want to offer four examples of this vision. First, in the early pandemic, we loved getting to share Sundays with other UU communities, didn't we? Yeah, it was fun. It's also such a time saver to share ideas and practices so fluidly. And so, rather than just reverting back to old silos in this moment, how about we take this moment to build a movement where collaboration is the norm? Because it is possible we don't actually need 1,000 separate membership committees. Or 1,000 different stewardship committees or 1,000 different online services every single Sunday. Example two, in the early pandemic, we knew how critical our local congregations are, how essential they are. And so maybe in our new collaboration, we will build new congregations or plant new campuses, especially in communities hardest hit by COVID or farthest away from abortion access, or in states currently criminalizing gender-affirming care for our children. How many ministries would we be starting if we decided our congregations matter at least as much as NPR? Or Planned Parenthood? And don't they? Or really, maybe our partnerships will lead us to pay more attention to the UU churches that are already in these communities and follow their lead. I mean, just imagine saying from within your church, dear UU churches in Arkansas and Alabama and Louisiana and Missouri and Wyoming. Now, I know Wyoming pretty well. It's very close to Colorado. So let me be here, pause here to be very specific. Imagine saying from within your congregation, dear friends in Casper and Cheyenne and Lar Laramie, Wyoming, we know that Unitarian Universalism is urgently needed in your communities. And we believe your churches are the best way for our faith to be made real. Thank you for your work on reproductive justice and trans inclusion. Here's some money. Do with it what you need to grow your church. We are praying for you. We are here for you because we are partners, all of us, and we can't give up on this big thing, this deal we make to love people in real life. And yes, that is the Reverend Leslie Key, who serves both in Casper and Laramie, Wyoming. This photo is of her at the abortion clinic that she and her church are starting to help start in Casper right now as a way of fighting the trigger laws in her state. <laughs> it's 
speaking of money, my third example. Early in the pandemic, we knew that, well, that quarantine impacted people differently. Some people lost jobs, some people couldn't get out of their homes, some people were totally fine. And the generosity that I saw during that time was phenomenal in our churches. Suddenly, it's like we understood that giving in our churches could be a radical act of equality and social justice. Or at least it can be when we meet our big dreams with big giving. But this is not the conversation happening in most of our churches right now. We are not talking about building a vision with big dreams. We're talking about cutting it pulling back on ministry because people have pulled back. But if we are even going to approximate that vision that we have now stitched upon our hearts, then we are going to need to stop spending hours in budget meetings talking about how we can find $200 or even $2,000. We cannot wait for the church to meet the longing we have and then give it is our giving that makes that longing a reality. Which brings me to my fourth and final example. In the crisis of 2020, what was clear more than anything was that there are a million places where people today can get great content. What people need more than anything now is great belonging. And the good news that we remembered in 2020 is that this is literally what Unitarian Universalists most have to offer. Our part of finishing the world is the practice of relationships, transformational relationships, accountable relationships, steadfast relationship. And so as we build, let's build up the practices of covenant that help us love each other in real life. Let's learn and teach a different way of checking in with each other. Not just with the people that we already know or who are like us, but beyond that, to ask ourselves who we haven't called, haven't considered, aren't yet in relationship with. And where checking in includes not just offering comfort, but also telling the truth in all its complexities and contradictions where it includes uncovering where we have failed each other and ourselves. And it includes asking for help and receiving help and praying together, healing, which it sounds sweet, like let's heal, but actually it's really hard and painful. But this is what our covenant actually requires. The hard work of healing in real life, repair, reconciliation, and recovery. In these days of disruption and destruction, we must give thanks that we survived. Our individual and collective survival, it is a miracle. And... Survival is too small a dream for our big faith. On these days, we must build a bigger dream for our world and for ourselves. We must remember the deal we make as Unitarian Universalists, group by group, congregation by congregation, partner by partner, in these little rooms and these sacred promises, we are big enough. And besides, our partners are counting on us, so we can't give up. Let's keep on finishing the world. Amen.
be reading our benediction. The work ahead is not small, and there will be many days where we feel we are too little. On those days, remember, you are big enough and you are not alone. Partners are everywhere, and they, we, are counting on you. So let us go and be the church. Be a blessing and keep on finishing the world. Our worship time has ended. Our service just begins. Go in peace and enjoy. Amen. sitting here wanting memories to teach me to see the beauty in the world through my own eyes yes i am sitting here wanting memories to teach me to see the beauty in the world through my own eyes you used to rock me in the cradle of your arms you said you'd hold me till the pains of life were gone. You said you'd comfort me in times like these, and now I need you, and now I need you. And you are gone. Yes, I am sitting here memories to teach me to see the beauty in the world through my own eyes. Since you've gone and left me, there's been so little beauty, but I know I saw it clearly in your eyes. Now the world outside is such a cold and bitter place. Here inside I have few things that will console. And when I try to hear your voice above the storms of life, then I remember that I was told. Yes, I am sitting here memories to teach me to see the beauty in the world through my own eyes. Yes, I am sitting here wanting memories to teach me to see the beauty in the world through my own eyes. I think on the things that made me feel so wonderful when I was young. I think on the things that made me laugh, made me dance, made me sing. I think on the things that made me grow into a being full of pride. Think on these things, for they are true. And I am sitting here memories to teach me to see the beauty in the world through my own eyes. I thought that you were gone, but now I know you're with me. You are the voice that whispers all I need to hear. I know I please and thank you and the smile will take me far. I know that I am you and you are me and we are one. I know that who I am is numbered in each grain of sand. I know that I've been tossed again and lost again and again and again and again. Yes, I am sitting here wanting memories to teach me to see the beauty in the world I'm sitting here wanting memories to teach me to see the beauty in the world through 